Uh, dear friends, um, hello. We're, my name is Volodymyr Skulkin, and I represent the Center for Urban History, and I will just briefly say a few words on our speaker today. I'm very grateful that you have joined us uh, today for these, in spite of this weather. Today we'll continue the Don Kult, and we have another uh, history, uh, lecture dedicated to history, that will be given by Hiraki Kuromiya uh, from the uh, Indiana University in the United States. Uh, Professor Kuromiya has already given a talk, um, the, the, his first talk that opened the, festi the Don Kult Festival on Monday. Yesterday we had a, a discussion on the uh, totalitarian experience of the Soviet Union, and today's talk is a logical continuation, perhaps conclusion, of these th of these three events. Today he will tell us about he will talk about the Great Terror and about uh, <coughs> Donbass and the role of Stalin in the Great Terror. I would just like to say a few words on uh, the speaker, on the professor. He is a well-known uh, historian of the Soviet Union and Ukraine. Uh, his first book, which came out in uh, 1988, was dedicated to the Stalin's industrialization and the fate of the workers in the first five-year plan. Um, after that, he worked for about a decade on on, a, on his synthesis of the history of the Donbass, which uh, came out in 1998 in English, and four years later was translated into Ukrainian. And after uh, his history of the Donbass, uh, starting from this publication, he focused largely on problems of mass repression and terror. And if you uh, look at this book on the Donbass, um, a large uh, a large segment of it is dedicated to the violence, terror, and repression in the history of the Donbass. And he continues dealing with this topic in his uh, subsequent uh, works. Spe specifically, in 2009, he published the book Voices of the Dead, the Great Terror of, n of the 1930s, which was uh, dedicated to the victims of the terror of the 1930s, uh, above all in Soviet Ukraine, and the people that were that were destroyed in this terror uh, returned to us. Uh, at least we can hear their voices and their thoughts in the pages of this uh, book. In 2012, uh, he published uh, "Conscience on Trial: The Focus, the the, the Fate of uh, 14 Pacifists in the Soviet Union," which talks about a group of uh, Reform Adventists from the town of Bila Tsarkva, which in 1953 were condemned uh, and sent to the Gulag for anti-Soviet uh, activities and insubordination to Soviet laws. Again, this is a kind of micro history of this terror of the victims of the t of this terror that allows us to uh, look at the mentality and um, and minds of the people who lived in those days today professor kurumi will try to generalize his uh, synthesize his research of the soviet of the soviet terror and again i'm very grateful uh, professor for visiting us here and the floor is yours <coughs> Thank you very much for a nice introduction, and uh, I'm very happy to speak here again. Um, today I'm going to talk about uh, the Great Terror, which is an extraordinary event in the extraordinary history of the Soviet Union. We do know that, uh, according to official statistics, about uh, 700,000 people were killed purposefully in 1937-38, which it took place in peacetime. Um, about 1.35 million people are arrested and indicted, and of them, nearly 700, to be exact, 680,000 people so were executed. This is an extraordinary event. It's extremely difficult to explain, even though we do know that the Stalinist period, the Soviet Union, was a very, very violent country. Uh, many people were arrested and very often executed. Nevertheless, these two years were extraordinary. 
how extraordinary these two years were, is very clear. If we look at uh, the uh, number of uh, people who were sentenced to death for political crimes uh, between 1921, when the Civil War ended, and when Stalin died in 1953, uh, these two years of uh, death sentences account for about 85% of all the death sentences given during uh, uh, the uh, 32 years or so. Or, and if we exclude the war and post-war years, in other words, if we take the 20 years from 1921 to 1941, 95% of all the death sentences were handed down in these two years. Moreover, moreover, if we look at the number of the you know, rate of executions, not all people who are arrested and indicted were executed, but if we look at these two years, about a little more than 50% of the people who are arrested and indicted in these two years were executed. So, and, and the nearest, nearest um, comparison, comparative year was probably 1930 or 1941, when at most 20,000 people were executed, and the execution rate was at most 3-4%. So these two years are more extraordinary years, so we needed to explain and what the impact of these events on the subsequent history of the Soviet Union including Ukraine and Donbass, and what are the implications of what Stalin did for today's Ukraine and the Donbass. So I'd like to discuss uh, uh, these issues. And first of all, I'd like to give you a sense, a sort of statistical sense of, of the terror, and then try to explain why this happened, this extraordinary event, why this happened, and then I'd like to discuss the significance and the implications of the Great Terror for Ukraine and the Donbass, and then uh, I'd like to make some concluding uh, remarks. So, uh, let me start with the first uh, question. So, who, who was the target and who was killed? It's very clear, actually, because the terror uh, was not random. It was a uh, directed against certain kinds of people. It's very clear, party, government, leaders, prominent leaders, uh, prominent uh, uh, writers, these people are target. And of course, military leaders, military commanders. And secondly, there was an operation called the Kulak operation, but Kulak Operation meant not just those who were uh, decolonized, those who were dispossessed at the time of collectivization in the early 1930s. They also included, this operation included to other categories of people who uh, the government regarded uh, as uh, politically unreliable, namely uh, religious leaders, uh, people who had uh, politically suspect activities, former members of the Socialist Revolutionary Parties or Menshevik Parties, and uh, hooligans and some criminals as well. And this other category of people were ethnic minorities. Most importantly, ethnic Poles, ethnic Latvians, Estonians, ethnic Germans, ethnic Korean, ethnic Chinese, and many other uh, non-Slavic nationalities. Jews were neither uh, disproportionately uh, affected or saved. So there, these categories of people were deliberately targeted and deliberately killed. We do know that, as I said, about 1.35 million people were arrested and indicted, and then 680,000 people or so were executed. Probably the number of executions 
uh, were higher because uh, very often um, uh, statistics were incomplete. There are many people who are beaten to death in jail. Uh, people like you know Vas uh, Vasily Bolukhin, uh, the marshal of the uh, Red Army. He was beaten to death in, in the interrogation. He died. So whether these people are counted, almost certainly they are not counted. So some people suspect that up to one million people were executed in these two years. And then there are statistical manipulations done by the secret police to, you know, to make them look better. There are all kinds of issues. Nevertheless, the, these numbers we have are not so bad, not so off the mark. So we'll take these numbers uh, at, at a starting point. Now, as far as Ukraine is concerned, I have to say that um, there's no evidence to show that Ukraine was disproportionately affected by the, by the terror. Ukraine's uh, population counted about 17.5% of the, the Soviet Union at that time, 1937. And uh, the uh, Ukraine's uh, uh, portion of the terror is uh, slightly higher, a little less than 200, uh, a le little less than 20, a little less than 20 percent. In other words, uh, a little over 260,000 people arrested and a little over 120,000 people were executed in Ukraine. So we cannot say that Ukraine was disproportionately affected by Stalin's terror. Well, it, it may not please us because we want to believe that Stalin disliked Ukraine, the Ukrainians are targeted, but things are not so, not simple, not so simple. In other words, there are other people in Ukraine who are affected. And I'd like to go back to this question later on in my, in my lecture. Now what happened is that they, the, the hardest hit people were those the Kulaks, who are those who are dispossessed during collectivization and exiled. And then of course, given the fact that Ukraine had a very fertile land, a very agricultural economy, Ukrainians portion in the terror, in Russia proper was probably very high because many of the Ukrainians were deported to Siberia, Central Asia, to the Russian north. So, you know, this is not easy to, to take uh, into account. Nevertheless, we do know that uh, the, the, the Kula population accounted for the largest number of Western kings. And then comes uh, the national operations. And here the Polish factor is the most important. Poles, Poles were hit extremely, extremely hard. If you look at the Ukrainian terror, uh, in absolute numbers, ethnic Ukrainians were hardest hit, no doubt. Then comes Poles. Then comes, uh, I think, Germans, and then comes the Russians. Oh, Russians were relatively small at that time. We look, if we look at uh, the Donbas, unfortunately we don't know uh, the, uh, the exact uh, number of ethnic Poles living in the Donbas area, so we don't have data on the, on the, on the Poles. But in absolute numbers, the hardest hit group was of course ethnic Ukrainians. Then comes the Germans, then comes ethnic Greeks, and then comes come the, the Russians. Uh, so here, in, yes, in Ukraine's case, ethnic uh, minorities played a very important role. Now, having said that, I have to say that the Ukraine produced a very large number of those people who were arrested and executed as a nationalist uh, insurgents, uh, Nazionali no Povtansky Organizati. There are great numbers of them. 
for obvious reasons, because Moscow uh, distrusted the uh, Ukrainian nationalists. Uh, and this is di different from Russia, per se, because uh, as far as I could tell, I cannot, uh, I don't know any Russian who was uh, uh, accused of being a Russian nationalist at that time. In other words, being Russian was safe, but being Ukraine, Ukrainian was not safe because uh, Ukrainians are potentially, uh, potentially uh, separatists. So that's one characteristic uh, of, of, of uh, the terror in Ukraine. So this is a larger, large picture of the terror in, in Ukraine. So after this, now I'm going to discuss why this happened. Now this is damn difficult, very difficult. And in general, uh, you may think that uh, Western, I mean Western scholars, Western historian, historians know a great de deal about uh, Soviet history, Ukrainian history. They may, but they often get things wrong. And in this respect, in my judgment, often Ukrainians and Russians get it right. Because they know the nature of the system, and often Western historians don't know the nature of the system, and get it wrong. How? Uh, I'm going to explain this. It's very interesting. Because uh, we want to show, Western historians want to show that uh, well, Stalin did it for no reason. Yeah? People, uh, people, we want to believe that the Soviet people, including the Ukrainian people, resisted the Stalinist system, often quite determinedly, and therefore Stalin wanted to get rid of them. That's fine. But when Western historians want to say that actually people were innocent, they, want, they have to say that actually there wasn't much open resistance. So Stalin killed many innocent people. Now how are you going to reconcile this? So there was a tension in Western historiography on the Stalin's terror. This was not solved until after the archives started opening up in the 1990s. But then, once we began to have access to the archives, things got even worse. Why? Because now, quite a few Western historians say that in fact, there was so much resistance to Stalinist politics, sometimes open resistance. The resistance opposition was so strong that Stalin had no choice but intervene and terrorize it. I have a polemic with uh, some of these people. Show me evidence. Evidence comes from the secret police reports. We have so many enemies in the country. They are scheming against us. They are so dangerous. That's the evidence they got. Uh -huh. <laughs> this is complete. They just take Stalinist propaganda at face value. Even some Russian historians say so. And some years ago, I had a very heated discussion with respectable Russian historians from Moscow. They say everyone in the Soviet Union was against the Stalinist system, and they wanted to fight. So I said, show me evidence. And they responded dreadfully, well, this is a fact, so we don't have to have evidence. <laughs> what kind of historian is this? There are other extremes. Those who believe that Western powers were so determined to uh, fight against the Soviet Union, penetrate the Soviet Union so deeply that Stalin had no choice but to respond. Again, evidence comes from some secret reports showing that the Germans, Poles, the Japanese have penetrated the Soviet uh, Union and so on. Uh, of course, these are police reports. In other words, they often take, often, almost always take Soviet secret disinformation, misinformation as facts 
and show that Stalin was reacting to pressure from inside and pressure from outside and made him rea uh, react by intervening uh, in society with terror. Now, this is a sort of reversed Stalinist version. In other words, Stalin's propaganda had been taken more or less at face value by, by very large number of Western historians. Now, I've been fighting against these people. Often they don't respond, so it doesn't become a real debate. But I'm saying it. Nonsense, this is Stalin. This is exactly the kind of picture Stalin wanted to show to the world to justify his terror. So how should we interpret this? Yes, it would be nice to think that, yes, so people were not intimidated by Stalin's dictatorship and fought. But in fact, it's not so simple. What happened is that, yes, because of a constant terror, people really couldn't speak up. Occasionally, did, they did speak up. But at the same time, secret police fabricated all kinds of accusations against uh, supposedly anti-Soviet moves of individuals and groups of people. In other words, of course, we do know that most of the Soviet people learned not to speak up. In other words, whatever sentiment they may have had against the Soviet system had to go underground. In other words, they kept these sentiments to themselves and therefore it became all the more difficult for the secret police to find who is not well disposed toward the Soviet system. So Stalin was operating under these conditions. What to do? And here I think we have to consider the fact of war. Yes, it was very clear that war would come. Stalin's assumption was right. The first threat, of course, comes from Japan, which is 1931, when Japan takes Manchuria, northeastern China which draws Japan and the Soviet Union face to face over the vast um, border from uh, the Pacific Ocean all the way to Mongolia. And Japan was very aggressive. And uh, at the time of uh, the famine in Ukraine, for the war, many of the resources we had in the Soviet Union and some of the resources grain we bought in Canada and Prussia were diverted to the East. That made the famine in Ukraine all the worse because of resources. Ukraine was at that time no longer a priority because uh, uh, Moscow concluded uh, a non-aggression pact with, uh, with uh, uh, Warsaw in July 1932. Stalin still believes that the Piłsudski may not uh, uh, may not ratify the pact, but indeed it turned out that uh, uh, Warsaw ratified uh, the pact in early December 1932. And that meant the western borderland was secured, and then, yes, Stalin felt free to attack Ukraine, take Ukraine, and divert them to the east to secure the East against uh, Japan. And then, of course, the uh, Western border became uh, later much more unstable because of Hitler's rise to power. And then, in, in January 1934, Poland and uh, Germany uh, strikes struck a non aggression pact, which made us start in very uh, suspicious of the secret deal between Poland and Germany, but by then, by, by the mid-1930s, Stalin knew that uh, Hitler would be determined to strike against the Soviet Union. After all, Hitler openly declared that Bolshevism was his life enemy. 
So he understood what would be coming. So start his mind is this. By then, after the Holod War, after terrible uh, terror against the Ukrainians, the Kazakhs, and others, you know, farming was overcome, and the 1934 17th Party Congress was convened, which came to be called the Congress of Victors. Of all the, because all these former oppositionists came out and re repented, and uh, they came to the side of Stalin, at least uh, on the surface. So by then, it was more or less clear that organized uh, opposition within the country, within the Soviet Union, would not pose a significant threat by itself. Because the secret police were controlling everywhere, watching everywhere, so the internal opposition was latent but would not pose a significant problem on its <coughs> own. However, there was a danger, which is the combination of external threat and internal threat. In other words, if there is a foreign intervention, then internal force and external force would combine and present a mortal danger to Stalin's power. And it was then that Japan and Poland had been working together against the Soviet Union. And Moscow knew about it. The collaboration did not go very far, but they were seriously working. Just as they worked together in 1904-1905 at the time of the Russo-Japanese War. And that certainly had an impact had an impact on the defeat of the Russian Empire by Japan because, for example, the Moscow had to keep a very large number of soldiers in Poland in case Poles rebel against the Russian power again. So they couldn't move a large number of soldiers from the east, from the west to the east. So certainly Stalin was afraid of this combined, combined aggression by uh, Poland and Japan. And then, of course, Hitler. Stalin comes to realize that Hitler was serious. Initially, Hitler, uh, Stalin wasn't quite aware of Hitler's danger, but by mid 1934, 34, 5, it was very clear that uh, Hitler would present a serious uh, threat. So here, three countries, Russia, Germany, Japan, Poland, would present a serious threat, what to do. And under these conditions, Stalin began to think about protecting his own power if indeed war begins. And then, yes, Japanese relations with Japan continued to deteriorate because Japan continued to be aggressive in China, going to the south, the heartland of China, and going to the east, Inner Mongolia, towards the border of Mongolian People's Republic, which was controlled by the Russians as a sort of satellite colonial state. And then Hitler uh, began to disarm itself, and so on. So under these conditions, Stalin began to think, if war starts, would these people, like former Ukrainian Kulak, Kulaks, sent Siberia, sent to Central Asia, hiding in the Donbas, would these people support the regime? So this kind of uh, uh, fear came to preoccupy Stalin. And as a way to eliminate all any possibility of subversion from within, 
it appears that Stalin meant to kill off these people. That solves the problem. Kill off. Get rid of them. So he went after all these people, assigned targets to all regions of the Soviet Union. How many people should be arrested and killed? He instructed that certain ethnic groups, particularly Poles, the Germans, interestingly, Germans fared far better because Stalin still kept the option of striking a deal with Hitler. And indeed, of course, Stalin struck a deal with Hitler later. So Germans were, were terrorized, but not as bad as <coughs> Poles. And if we look at the number of spies who were arrested, so the so-called spies who were arrested at that time, the largest numbers of spies are Polish spies, about 100,000. And it comes the Japanese spies, 50 or 60,000, even though there were only probably a dozen or so ethnic Japanese living in the Soviet Union. <laughs> but huge number of Japanese spies arrested. And then German spies were relatively few, of 30 or 40,000. Very odd, but Stalin kept the option of striking a deal with Hitler. Dirty for option, but uh, he thought that it would be beneficial to his own power. So under these conditions, Stalin went after any potential threat. Now, this is, this is a dreadful policy, but that's what he did. Now, we do know, however, that so many military commanders were decimated. So the high command was decimated. Tchaikovsky was the most uh, uh, famous example. So if I mention war factor, people say, well, what kind of nonsense is that? If Stalin meant to prepare for the war, why did he kill him? military leaders? Yes, indeed, good question. But there is a logic to it. There is a logic to it. In other words, Stalin did not trust all the cadres who came from, say, noble backgrounds or those who were trained uh, under the Tsarist regime. He certainly did not trust them. So he killed off these people and promoted new people like Zhukov, who were, were beholden to the Soviet regime for their rights. And a lot of think, people think that this is a complete nonsense. And I have been criticized by my colleagues in America and Europe. I said, why is it? Of course it makes sense. It does make sense to me, and it did make sense to Hitler. To Hitler. When Stalin was killing me, the Red Army commanders, Hitler was very surprised. And Hitler said, Stalin was a crazy. The German word is Gehirnkrank, means uh, uh, sick in his brain. Basically, Hitler couldn't understand that, and said Stalin was crazy to kill off his military commanders. But, but, in 1945, when it became clear to Hitler that he was losing war against Stalin, what did Hitler say? Hitler said, Hitler understood Stalin, Stalin's logic. Hitler said Stalin managed to create his own military forces, military forces, elite who were loyal to Stalin. Look at me. I couldn't do it. All these uh, 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 he, uh, the, uh, the German Wehrmacht commanders were sort of, you know, Prussian aristocrats who did not necessarily share Nazi ideology and they were not necessarily loyal to the German ideology. He said, I should have, I should have done it, but it would have taken 15 years at least, but I couldn't wait for 15 years. So, yes, 
In that sense, Hitler did understand Stalin's logic. And this logic may sound crazy, and many of my own colleagues in the United States and Europe say that the economy is crazy, but uh, well, I have Hitler's, uh, Hitler's support. So I think, yes, in this sense, Stalin is an extraordinary figure. Killing what meant nothing to him, but uh, keeping his power by doing anything, killing of people en masse, was perfectly acceptable. And in that way, I think uh, it seems that Stalin was relatively successful in the war effort against, against uh, Hitler's military forces. Duke of Stalin, you know, they get, got along more or less, whereas Hitler had a great deal of problem with his own military commanders. And Stalin and his uh, uh, advisors, they were all convinced that they were absolutely right. And Vyacheslav um, uh, Molotov, yes, Stalin's right hand man, his remarks are extremely interesting. In the 1970s, Molotov lived long uh, to be 90 or so, died in 1985 or so. But in the 1970s, Russian poet called uh, Felix, Felix Chulev uh, had uh, 120, 140 interviews with Molotov. There is a book called Stosorak Beset, uh, a Stalin name. Uh, fantastically interesting book. And one of the conversations, Chulev asked uh, Molotov, people say that you signed this uh, secret protocol to the molotov ribbentrop Pact of August 1939, the famous secret protocol which divided Central and Eastern Europe into Soviet and German sphere of influence. Is this true? And Molotov was so embarrassed and said no. I never did. Of course he told a lie. He was so embarrassed about the blatantly imperialistic uh, policy of the Soviet Union. So he denied it. But then Chuyev said, you know, we hear that you, Stalin, Kaganovich, these people signed the execution orders in 1937-38. Is it true? And then Molotov, Molotov said, Yes, true. I did sign execution orders. So he was not embarrassed about uh, having ordered uh, uh, so many people killed. So he was a sort of he was convinced that uh, these mass killings were perfectly justified in order for the Soviet regime to survive. So it is very interesting in that sense. So I'd say that this is a logic of the Stalinist uh, uh, terror. There are a lot of things I should add, but I'll stop here, and then I'd like to go on to discuss the implications of this for Ukraine and the Donbass, and the Donbass. Now, as far as the Donbass is concerned, it appears that, yes, Donbass was indeed harvested by Stalin's great terror in Ukraine. We don't have the data for 1938 because uh, the Stalin Oblast was divided into two, Stalin Oblast in Voroshilovgrad, Oblast, and uh, it's very difficult to, uh, you know, collect uh, uh, um, data. But we do have data on 1937, and there, yes, Donbass was not the largest Oblast. Uh, Kiev and uh, Kharkiv were the largest the most populous of about half a million people, more than Stalin Oblast, but the number of indicted and executed in Stalin Oblast was the largest in 1937. Moreover, the largest number of terror uh, executions that concerned the so-called Kura cooperation, 50% of the ex executions based on this uh, operation took place in the Stalin Oblast, in the Donbass, 55 us. That's about more than half of Ukrainian execution in that operation took place in the Donbass. What does it mean? Uh -huh. Very clear to me. 
and all of a sudden we presented a place of refuge and freedom. Indeed, many Ukrainian Kulaks who escaped deportations to Siberia, Central Asia, or the Russian North fled to the Donbass, hid there, and tried to find a new life. But they were caught in 1937-38. Many of them were executed. Although it could have been worse, because there are reports that uh, some of these workers are so important, and if they were arrested, <coughs> production would suffer so much that we simply can't do it. And quite a few people survived because of their importance to the running of the coal mining industry. Now, Ukraine's case, as I said, Ukraine didn't seem to have been disproportionately affected by the crater. But if you look at non Slavic nationalities of Ukraine, particularly the Poles, dreadful. Poles, ethnic Poles were 15 times more likely to be executed than Ukrainian as a whole. Germans, probably about eight times or so, Greeks, about five times or so, and in the case of Donbass, yes, Ukraine, uh, the, the Germans and Greeks, they suffered most. Probably Poles suffered more than these people, the Greeks are uh, Germans, but unfortunately, the 1930 census doesn't have data on ethnic Poles in the Donbass, so we, we can't say, but by and large, Poles in Ukraine were terrorized, completely terrorized. In other words, Russians, Ukrainians fared better. But the Poles, Germans, ethnic minorities fared much worse. Now, did Stalin become suddenly pro-Ukrainian? No, that's not true. It's that uh, he was more concerned about the possible danger of ethnic Poles and Germans and so on. Germans fared better for the reason, as I said, the reason I already said. However, however, Certain kinds of Ukrainians were extremely dangerous. In other words, those Ukrainians who emigrated to Soviet Ukraine from Galicia and Western Ukraine, because uh, they were tainted by being the citizens of uh, Poland. Many of them were leftists or communists or socialists. They thought the Soviet, Soviet Ukraine would be better. They came here, they were decimated completely, or completely decimated. And then, in 1941, after the war uh, started, uh, Stalin suddenly became very pro-Polish, pro, pro yes? And he, he killed off Poles in 1937-38, dreadful. And then, he destroyed Poland in collusion with Hitler in 1939, and suddenly Poland becomes so important. So he, on the one hand, he becomes very pro-Polish, but of course he, he killed off all, the, all these Polish elites in Katyn and elsewhere. But of course on the south he wanted to show that he is very pro-Poland. And in 1941, I think, when Stanislav Anders had a conversation with Stalin. Stalin said something terribly interesting. Of course, Poles complained about their Ukrainians. And believe and elsewhere, they are causing problems <coughs> to us, working with the Germans and so on. Stalin said, and let me quote it, unfortunately we don't have the Russian original, it, uh, we have only uh, Polish, uh, version quoted by um, uh, Anders, but this is what he said. They are, in other words, the Galician Ukrainians. They are your Ukrainians, not ours. We'll work together to obliterate them. <laughs> in Polish it's uh, 
так, але то були ваші українці, не нас. Ми їх посупили з унищиченими, з унищиченими, унищиченими, як дати, з унищиченими. So, it's, it's terribly funny in that sense. He, he, you know, he, he, his change of nationality is danger. Changes very quickly at the time of the all of course, the Ukrainians. Then Poles, and then changes, you see, here. In Soviet Ukraine, probably, Ukrainian ethnic Ukrainians fared relatively better. But there is another factor to Ukrainian problems at the time of the Great Dinner, which is the Japanese connection. We all know German connection, we all know Soviet, uh, Polish connections. But in the 1930s, the Japanese were working with, with Ukrainian immigrants of all the stripes, actually. OUN, of course. But that is, caused a problem with Poles, because Poles could not accept OUN and it's, the, it's terror against the Poles. So Japan worked with OEN, but it didn't allow OEN to criticize <laughs> Poland. But it also worked with the Skoropatsky group. It worked with the UNL people, Kransk Narodna Republic people, through Poles, through Poles, Prometheism, or this sort of international group working against the Soviet Union. So at the time of the Great Zilla in 1937, for example, OUN sent its operatives all the way from Europe to Japan to engage in subversion in the Far East. They were trained by the Japanese and sent to Manchuria. What happened to them, I'm not sure, but at least some survived and later on wrote memoirs. So we know these things. But there are all these subversions taking place, particularly, particularly organized by the Poles and Japanese. And that's why there were so many Polish and Japanese spies were caught. Now, this may give an excuse for starting to crack down on people, but that is a wrong impression. In other words, many of these organizations, including all the end, had long been deeply penetrated by Soviet agents. We do know that Konovalets was executed and killed by Sudoplatov, Pavel Sudoplat, in Rotterdam in 1938. The head of all division in Helsinki was a Soviet agent. So starting here, what these emigre organizations were doing? What Germany, Japan, Poland were doing against the Soviet Union, he clearly felt that the Soviet Union was probably okay. But there is a bit of a possibility that the Soviets were missing some foreign agents. So in 1937, Stalin says this. You know, the 5% of truth is basically truth. And here, the Russian regional, we have a Russian, Russian regional, which is a yes, the budget, Pravda, na pięć procentów, to i eta chleb. It's a bit sort of difficult to translate, but basically he said, if five percent is truth, we have to take it as truth. In other words, leave no sort of loose ends open, we'll go after any possibility, all the possibility, and try to eliminate any uh, contingency uh, problems. And here, as I think uh, Stalin's uh, uh, fondness of the playwright Mikhail Bulgakov is very interesting. You know Bulgakov uh, uh, was in Kiev, he wrote this famous uh, play called uh, uh, Ukrainian writers, proletarian writers, complained about uh, Bulgakov. This is bourgeois literature, not proletarian literature. But Stalin said, no, I like Bulgakov very much because 
Stalin said. This story shows what he said. Sesa kursha isha sila bolshevizma. So, the all conquering power of Bolshevism. In other words, people understand that it was impossible to resist Bolshevism. There is no choice but succumb to the power of Bolshevism. So that way he wanted to intimidate them and then subjugate the entire nation to his power. And that seems to be what Stalin did uh, at the time of the Great Terror. So let me conclude in just a few more minutes. Um, I think that what uh, Stalin did in the Great Terror is basically combining uh, internal and external aggression. Now, in the West, we, well not me, but many other people think that uh, Stalin did not engage in aggression. Stalin was uh, responding to Western threat. Well, that's complete nonsense, imagine that. If you look at the East, in Europe, everyone was watching. Eh? It was very difficult to engage in any aggression. Until uh, September 1939, yes, and, and, uh, invaded Poland and then a few months later invaded uh, Finland and so on. By then he was open. But before that, Stalin was doing all kinds of military aggression in Asia. Exactly in 1929, he invaded China to take uh, uh, the uh, uh, Eastern China Railway which the Imperial Russian government ran as a colonial project which the Soviet Union inherited and uh, for over the possession, over the running of this railway, Stalin sent military forces. In the end he sold, it was so embarrassing, so he sold the railway to Japan with Europe. That was all progression. But there are covert operations which reminds me of what uh, Putin is doing in the Donbass. In other words, in Mongolia, in Xinjiang, Muslim areas of China, Eastern Turkestan, there were rebellions. Particularly in Xinjiang, and then in Central Asian uh, uh, the secret place, uh, Ogepegu and El Kalede, and Comintang so wanted to support the Muslim rebellions as a national liberation movement. This is 1933-4, and then late 1937. Stalin said, no, this is dangerous. If they gain uh, some momentum, then Britain and Japan will come. And this opens direct route to Western Siberia, which is a center of Soviet defense industry. We cannot possibly allow this. So instead of supporting a national liberation movement of Muslims against Han Chinese government, Stalin sent Soviet military forces, disguising them as Chinese forces. Now that they use, he used uh, Kyrgyz, Kazakhs, and dressed them as Chinese, and then <laughs> they fought against the Muslims. And then, of course, there were also Russian white forces stationed in, in Xinjiang. So here, are Soviet soldiers and anti-Soviet emigre soldiers were fighting together against, against uh, the Muslims. And this was completely uh, disguised. We didn't know, well, some Western intelligence uh, suspected that Stalin was doing, but no historians talk about it. Well, some Chinese historians certainly know about it. There are lots of Chinese sources, very few uh, Russian sources. Mongolia is similar. And using this sort of covert operations, uh, Soviet Union had been engaging in external aggression in the East, not in the West. So combining this, and then he finally 
engaged in massive internal aggression in order to eliminate any possibility of internal and external threat becoming combined to present any danger to his power. And the Donbass case is interesting, even though Donbass uh, was not very close to the international border, although Caucasus was uh, relatively close, and there, of course, uh, Japanese and Caucasians were working. I even wrote a book with my friend, with a Georgian friend. I haven't published it, published it, an essay, but uh, so there is a bit of impact probably on the Donbass. But the Donbass had very strong foreign connections, and that's part of the reason why the Germans, or part of the reason why many Germans were repressed. And the Donbass industry had very strong uh, connection to foreign countries, particularly Germany, and already, already in 1928, there was the first show trial of uh, uh, these uh, engineers called Schachtin, Schachtin, Schachtinsky process, yes, yeah, Schachtin trial in, in 1928. That is certainly precursor of uh, the Moscow show trials of 1936, 7, and 8. So, in this sense, I think we have to understand that uh, Stalin engaged in both external and ex internal aggression in the 1920s and 1930s, and some of the experiences Stalin, uh, Stalin had were seem to be using seems to be used by uh, uh, Putin right now in Eastern Ukraine. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Kurumiya, for this uh, interesting and substantial lecture. I think we have about half an hour for questions and answers or any comments that the audience might have. Therefore, I want to encourage you to ask your questions, should you have any. There's one question. Um, I will ask my question in Ukrainian. Uh, Mr. Professor, thank you very much for your lecture. Um, I've been thinking about this fact that you mentioned at the beginning of your lecture, uh, that the Stalin uh, region and the Donbass had a very high uh, rate of the repressed people. Isn't it connected uh, with the um, high level of urbanization um, in this region? and some other characteristics of this region. Solzhenitsyn wrote about that, that 1937, 1938 are very well-known years because this terror uh, also uh, touched upon uh, the urban population intelligentsia. But in general, the number of the uh, repressed um, in the uh, 1937, 37, and the number of repressed at the beginning of the 1930s, then it was more or less the same. So isn't it related to some urban characteristics of this region? Yes, in terms of what they call the Sruzhbovtsi in Ukraine, and, and I think Sruzhashi, I think, in, in Russia, yeah? yes. The Donbass, the repression rate of the Donbass is extremely high, something like 45% or something. This is in Volodymyr uh, Nikolsky's book called Repressivna Diarina Sci Organif Derjarno Despecti SRSR, which was published about uh, 10 years ago. It's very detailed the statistical analysis uh, based on the documents he got in the SBU archive. In, in Kiev. So, yes, yes, it's possible. On the other hand, we do know that the vast majority of people repressed in the Donbass and elsewhere were just normal, ordinary people like workers and peasants and uh, others. Yes, uh, because of the visibility of leaders, government leaders, industry leaders, party leaders, they were repressed. Fewer people, and therefore proportionately more people were repressed under these uh, uh, of these classes. But uh, uh, 
Anno Tentani show with Adonbas particular social structure had any particular impact? No, I, I, I'm not quite sure. It, the, I think the fact that there was suspicion that Donbass was the center of politically unreliable people. Look at these people hiding in Donbass mines. They were all former Kuraks. How could we trust these people? So, uh, you know, um, yes, um, foreign connection, but particular social structure, whether it had any particular impact on the, the peculiarity of the terror in the Donbass, I'm not quite sure. That's my answer, yeah. Uh, Mr. Professor, thank you very much for your lecture. It's been very interesting. Uh, in the limelight, it's, I'm going to ask a question. Um, in the focus of uh, your attention um, are the motives of Stalin, and you try to investigate why Stalin did this and not that. But from the point of view of um, historical science, wouldn't it be uh, more logical to research those processes that were happening in society and started from the bottom? So maybe the actions by Stalin uh, were a response to the developments in society, not the cause. So maybe it would be more logical or reasonable to research the processes in society. I mean, yes, no doubt that there are problems uh, among the people. They were unhappy, but they also learned not to open uh, their minds because it was dangerous. It wasn't indeed dangerous, just uh, one silly joke may lead to your death. So most people learned not to speak up. And therefore, the Soviet secret police went after certain people, framing frame crimes fabricate crimes, fabricate anti-soft jokes, and so on. So the direction came from above. Reaction from the from below had very little impact on the way Stalin conducted the terror. They had already been preparing individual files. Ivan Ivanovich is dangerous. So the secret police were watching, they were informers, and they all had these files on individuals. And at some point, when the order comes from Moscow, they use these files and, okay, let's arrest this. And his friends, he's, a, you know, a soldier. So, yes, we cannot say that people didn't say anything against the regime. Of course the regime was dictatorial. Of course life was terribly difficult. Of course they knew that they could not speak up. Therefore, they, there are many unhappy people, no doubt about it. But they also learned not to act or speak because that would, was extremely dangerous. So I would not say that there was any sort of a factor that uh, created, uh, um, you know, that contributed to the terror by Stalin. No, it all came from above. So there are people in the West who say that, yes, indeed, impetus came from, that seems to be exactly the kind of picture Stalin wanted to present. Look at these people. They were angry with the Soviet regime. They were enemies. They were German spies or Polish spies, Japanese spies. No. But that's the reason pretend, uh, pretext that Stalin used. But they, of course, it was merely pretext. There was very little actual uh, factor that came from below. It all went underground. That's why secret police had to work very hard to find who is not happy with the Soviet regime, who might betray the country in the event of war. I will um, allow myself to ask a question, which is a kind of continuation to, to this question. It was a very interesting quotation from Stalin about this, even there is a 5% of truth which is already truth. And, uh, uh, yes, and my question is, uh, according to our today's contemporary data, uh, uh, what was the percentage of real spies, Polish spies, German spies, oh, I don't know, uh, other ethnic Japanese spies, can we determine uh, 
was it 5% or maybe 10% from this victim? Yeah, virtually zero. Um, you know, the, we, yes, we do have some remarks that uh, Japan, Poland, uh, uh, you know, other countries had some spies. Um, uh, and the real spies, if they indeed existed in the Soviet Union, all survived. In other words, uh, you know, the way operation is very clear. Any contact, any contact with foreigners, any contact with foreign diplomats uh, was deemed uh, dangerous. So they were all, all rounded up. Any visitor to the German, uh, Polish, uh, uh, and other consulates in Ukraine, for example, or any visitors to the Japanese consulate in Odessa, all these people watched the secret police, watched every visitor, recorded everything, and then in 1937, 38, they were arrested. No, I don't think this, just finding collaborators, informers was damn difficult. And we have some reports by Poles and Japanese that they operated such and such, a, you know, informal spies. Almost all of them were secret police agents working for the Soviet secret police. In other words, they chose certain kinds of peeps, keep people and provide them to foreign uh, diplomats. So virtually there was no possibility of foreign countries to recruit any Soviet uh, collaborators. Almost no. It doesn't mean that there was a no one may have been, but real spies survived, no doubt. Uh, uh, so, there was, in, by contrast, Soviet secret operations were extremely successful. Extremely successful in all these countries, in Japan, in Poland, in Britain, in Germany, in France, and in the United States. Extremely successful, no doubt. Soviet Union has penetrated almost all important countries' uh, services, but uh, the others, and that's part of the reason why Stalin killed off, just in case, just 5% of this or that group are potentially connected to the foreign country services. Let's get rid of them. Then everything will be fine. So it's a dreadful logic, no evidence. But any of them, any of them had any uh, real, uh, you know, function of uh, helping foreign countries? No, zero, as far as we could tell. Um, thank you for the lecture, uh, uh, Mr. Professor. Um, we, you said about. Um, well, Stalin's propaganda during the 1930s, which are, was during terror, making some, well, uh, oppression on people. Uh, but I won't ask you for, say, my, my more specific words about uh, uh, weapons of mass deception. Uh, because as we know, in early 30s, it's uh, like Soviet propaganda system, it's already was a well, well fund, funded system built around twin aims uh, around aggression and submission. So, uh, what do you mean comment about? Well, not more specific words about this. Thank you. Uh, yeah, the, the part of submission is very clear. I made every effort to submit everyone to the Soviet system. And the integration, integration efforts went on until 1932, until Holodomor, I think. Already, you know, Ukrainizatsia, Koreanizatsia, they began to be curtailed in 1929. You know, this uh, uh, trial of uh, Spiro Kadezva in Ukraine, that started in 1928 29. And there was a big trial in Kharkiv in 1930. But still, Ukrainizatsia went on in Kuban too, someone from Kuban, yes, in Kuban too. But the ones, uh, uh, Moscow concluded this non-aggression pact with Poland and, and Poland uh, ratified it in early days, December 1932. Moscow's conclusion was that, okay, uh, we, 
the Western borders are safe, the Ukrainization and others, these problems went too hard and therefore we just you know, restrict it and then resources were moved to the East to cope with, with Japan. Uh, and um, that probably ended, ended integration, real efforts to integrate uh, Ukrainians and uh, other national minorities. Instead, they became more suspect. Ukrainians fared better, except that uh, they were potential nationalists and separatists, but uh, non-Slavic nationalities. And it was then that Moscow began to compile, for example, all ethnic Germans. In other words, they collected data on each single ethnic German in the Soviet Union. And these lists were completed by the end of 1934. And I, I suppose that they did the same of ethnic Poles. So by then, they concluded that, okay, the integration policy of the 1920s either did not work properly or went too, hard, too, too far and therefore let's assume that these people were potential enemies, potential uh, uh, non-supporters of the Soviet system. So the integration policy of the 1920s uh, came to an end by 1932 or so. Sir, I, I thank you very much for this lecture. My name is uh, Volodymyr Semistye from Luhansk. Of course, Stalin was preparing for war, and of course he was interested in uh, raising the industry in the Donbass. But at the same time, among the repressed, the, the largest numbers are the so-called Stakhanovites. So the question is, would you say that this problem, did you study this problem? Why? Is, why was the high number of uh, repressed was among the innovators in production and Stakhanovites, the best workers? Um, there are many questions, uh, w w many mysterious questions <laughs> in the history of uh, Stalinism and the Soviet Union. So, you know, we've had many discussions with the Ukrainian historians, the Russian historians. In the end, many of them says, so I feel the same way, but what I could say is that being visible, in other words, having high positions, positions of responsibility was dangerous. In other words, whatever problems uh, emerged uh, uh, were uh, you know, dumped on those people who had power, who were on positions, on position, in positions of responsibility. So yes, from economic point of from from econo economic point of view, it doesn't make sense to repress those who were, you know, good workers, innovators, Stahanovites, and so on. But see, being visible made them more vulnerable to terror. And we do know that Stahanov himself wasn't repressed. He became drunkard and um, he didn't do much after he achieved this uh, re record, but uh, he survived. Uh, but uh, others obviously didn't. He, start, he, he, start, he probably he, they couldn't uh, do anything about Stahanov because he became such heroes. But others who became so prominent um, went to positions of responsibility were held accountable for the problems that caused. But as I said, not all prominent, not all uh, you know, innovators and standbites were repressed. Why they were dispersed, portionally repressed? Probably because they were more visible. They made themselves more uh, vulnerable to accusations. And indeed, many ordinary people thought that these people were, were not on our side, you see. They were so a the great deal of hidden resistance to the Stalinites. They were, you know, you know serving uh, the government, uh, bad policies and things. So, but again, many things certainly 
are not clear to me. As I cannot pretend that I understand everything. So in this case, honestly, I say I'm not entirely sure why, but I have certain certain ideas. <laughs> Excuse me, you worked in Kyiv. No, I'm sorry, you can't. I was given the microphone. I'm interested to hear. Um, I am a cultural anthropologist. What have you, what documents have you seen that uh, have to do with people that have experienced the so-called uh, Soviet criminal uh, or, uh, psychiatry? Because and and post Soviet because those methods that existed in Stalinism most of them have survived and these are prof profoundly corrupt uh, a sphere that uh, where the regional authorities doesn't really know what they're doing and so it seems like almost all medical institutions in in the Viva, especially the psychiatry is in a very bad condition what would you say well i, I i'm not quite sure how to respond um, um, there are all kinds of uh, uh, issues we, uh, as I said, we simply do not understand. Uh, documents are forged, uh, stolen, <laughs> destroyed. So no, I don't have any, any, any good answer or comments on that, unfortunately. I have a question. For, for, all, the, for, all, the, uh, for all that it's obvious that terror happened, uh, Stalinist terror. Uh, right now, the Russian regime is trying to reanimate the image of Stalin in the society, in the Russian Federation. And you commented that um, people then learned to keep their mouths shut, learned to keep their minds to themselves. So, how would you comment the behavior of Russians today? Are they still keeping that habit? To, to just keep their mouth shut, or are they um, willing consumers of all the images and products that are served uh, to them, including the reanimated uh, image of Stalin? You know, there are memorial plaques and, mem and, and monuments. To us, it's absurd, but to, to them, perhaps it's normal. Uh, Russia is always a mystery. There's much that is not clear. Of course, we don't live in, in Stalin's time. Putin is not Stalin. Uh, Russia still has some openness, some freedom, still has access to the internet, and some people still speak out against Putin. Nemtsov was murdered. Now, I know, I know that uh, many and some of my own friends uh, in Russia oppose Putin. Uh, princip uh, in a very principled uh, and are in a very principled opposition to Putin, but I understand that sometimes it's very difficult to speak out openly against this sort of gov government that may uh, punish you, that can punish you very harshly. And yes, I understand that um, they're afraid. That's my understanding, but it does not mean that they might that they might not speak against the government. Yes, some people do speak out. Some people do um, have connections with uh, the uh, international community and uh, speak more or less openly, perhaps somewhat covertly. So it's not a Stalin society. It's not a Stalinist society. Perhaps the mentality, that fear of uh, authority is there. But, you know, we, we have that too. I'm not afraid, but you know, some of my colleagues don't want to speak openly, let's say in Germany. I mean, I don't know. I, if you listen to, it's the same thing in the States also. So yes, some, some people are also afraid to speak their mind and all the more so in Russia. So I understand that there is fear, but it does not mean that, um, that they truly support uh, Putin's government. Although, as I've said um, several days ago, um, if these 
these uh, polls are actually correct. The, whatever the eighty percent uh, support support Putin, I am uh, surprised. Perhaps, but perhaps I'm wrong. Um, so I don't know. Of course, of course, there is mentality, there is fear, but it doesn't mean that um, that uh, the Russian society is a Stalinist society. Uh, perhaps some some uh, think think that Stalinist times were really a more disciplined etc etc but uh, it's, it's, it, Russia today is, is not a Stalinist society it's a much more open society and Putin cannot completely shut down and completely isolate uh, the Russian society because of the uh, surrounding uh, world Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Professor. Uh, we are approaching the end of our event today. Um, I will allow myself to make two short announcements. Uh, the cultural forum Don Kult is um, underway, and uh, the uh, further we get, the more interesting um, it is getting. I want to invite you for some other events uh, today at 1600 uh, um, at the Theater of uh, Youth and Children. Uh, there will be um, a um, theatrical performance, um, grain uh, storage. And it's a very interesting uh, play because it's dedicated to historical issues. And after that, uh, there will be a discussion, uh, the past on stage and uh, reflections on the uh, complicated um, history. And the participants of the discussion will be the um, director and author of this play and also well-known uh, critics, both from Lviv and elsewhere. And uh, tomorrow, uh, the program will continue here at the Center for Urban uh, history. We're really happy to see Olena Sashkina uh, here and at 2 o'clock um, uh, p.m. Uh, you will be able to hear her lecture. I'm sure that um, you all know Olena Sashkina because she is an active participant and contributor to any discussions on the matter of the Donbass, so you're welcome to join. And then at 1600 there will be another interesting discussion. Uh, um, um, the past in the changing um, borders uh, and um, how to uh, write history in these uh, changing conditions. Uh, Mr. Karumia will participate in this discussion. Um, Lena Stashka is another participant of the discussion and also Sergei Kelchik from Canada. And uh, the discussion will be moderated by Sofia Yak, director of the Center for Urban History. So the discussion will take place at 1600 here at the Center for Urban History. So you all are invited. You're welcome to join in our lectures and discussions. I want to say thank you to all our volunteers. Thank you for participating in this